I do think that the United States wants to use stable coins to devalue its debt. I think at best they'll be modestly successful at that and that it's it's kind of overhyped. It's a it's a thing that there's some truth to it, but it's overhyped. Uh, so the first one is we're talk of replacing the Fed. Here here's the issue. So in 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 current central banking globally, other than like previously failed states that kind of gave up central banking, the what money is, what the dollar is, is defined by the Fed. They are running this like multi-trillion dollar spreadsheet that that just underlays the global system. And every every kind of commercial bank, you know, they they tie into this foundational ledger. So it's not the same as just going back to the free market setting interest rates. The central bank in all these countries defines what that country's monetary base is. So I, do I think that's going to go away anytime soon? No. You know, I, I if you ask me personally, should the market set rates or should a council of like uh, elders set interest rates? A council I, of elders, yeah. Yeah, I like the markets. <laughs> uh, you know, the, I like the market rather than the Politburo mm. setting rates. Not the world we live in, I would like it. And then the two is, who, who should run the monetary base? Now, if you go back far enough, it was distributed. It was, it was basically gold was the monetary base. Uh, on top of that, you had free banking, basically. And then that gradually got replaced by central banking. Now, if you read Broken Money, I kind of talk about why this was somewhat of a technological inevitability. It's not an accident that it happened everywhere and mm-hmm. then persisted for a long time. It's not like people will say, you know, if only we didn't create the Fed in 1913. It's like, well, the Fed was a laggard. The whole the whole developed world had already gone that direction. They just got, they hopped on the train that was already leaving mm. the station, and they weren't even. I mean, the UK was the global reserve current at the time. So basically, this was a technological trend that largely was tied to the telecom world, which was before then central banks did exist primarily to like you know make trading easier between banks and to finance their government, which is not a great reason. And but then they all gained power and spread everywhere. Once you had telecoms, because you could you could send money around at the speed of light, but gold was still physical, and so they kind of unified it all with all the pros and cons that come with that. And so, what do I think it would take to replace central banks? I think it would take two million dollar Bitcoin. Yeah, basically, I think which so is, too. Uh, yeah, I think nothing short of an incredibly successful decentralized ledger will displace. These other ledgers. Now, let's say, in a, let's say Bitcoin failed. What what happens instead? Probably you have some sort of eventually gold reset, where sovereign debt kind of gets like nominally, like not not nominally, but like real purchasing power terms repudiated, loses confidence. Then they have to kind of temporarily do a gold peg or something, or some mm-hmm. sort of quasi gold peg, like you some see some of these like failing like emerging markets do, regain some sort of stability after they've already burned away all the, the prior bondholders, but for 80% of the value, whatever the case may be, find some way to, keep, to stabilize. And then you probably just repeat this current system. You have a whole nother long-term debt cycle. So that that's in the Bitcoin fails mode. I still think you don't really replace central banking, but you probably temporarily tether it to gold for a period of time until they just break it again for the same reason they broke it everywhere before. To permanently replace central banking, I think decentralized ledger of which Bitcoin is head and shoulders uh, our best chance. Yeah. Uh, the, and then, so the second part was stable coins after that long rant. Uh, so stable coins, since my article in January, 2021, so back then stable coin market cap was something like 40 billion. And I, I, I talked about why I didn't really like Ethereum that much. Uh, I was like, this is mostly speculation. It's like various tokens that help you trade tokens and and various tokens that help you lever tokens and it's like the problem here is it's it's just it's turtles all the way down i was like the one exception in like everything outside of bitcoin and the altcoin space is basically stable coins Mm -hmm. so at 40 billion dollar market cap i was like i think the market cap of stable coins is going to keep growing huge Uh, and i i mean i've talked to ceos of stable coin companies the the big ones you know i've talked to people that are tied in i've i've operated company I've, i've been on boards or invested in companies for example that use stable coins or tie in stable coins in some way. I mean, now the, now the market's in the, you know, couple hundred billion. So that thesis has been correct for four or five years. My current view is that stable coins are going to continue to grow. I think they could reach a half a trillion and eventually a trillion dollar market cap. City released a report earlier this year and Scott Besson cited it. Now City released a bear case, a base case, and a bull case for what stable coin market cap can look like in 2030. Scott Percent, of course, cited the bull case, which was like 3.7 trillion AUM in five years. 
uh, it's not my base case. That's not even City's base case. That's their bull case. Their base case, I forget the number. I don't have in front of me something like a trillion or a trillion and a half. I still think that's bullish, but that's I think it's more in the realm of possibility. But then you have to break down when you kind of look and say, how do they get these estimates? They showed their work. They said, okay, we're going to take 10% of this market, you know, onshore bank deposits. We're going to take 20% of this market, which is like Euro dollar deposits. We're going to take 20% of money markets. We're going to take 10% of physical cash markets. And they, that, that's where their estimates would come from. And then they do a sum of parts. Mm. The thing is, some of what they're taking from are entities that hold treasuries, right? Banks, even other, other currencies and their central banks often hold treasuries. Uh, money markets hold treasuries. Now, the difference is stable coins, at least their current iteration, are full reserve. And so instead of holding, you know, a bank might hold 20% treasuries and 10% cash and 30 and 70% loans, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you take that and you put it in a stable coin, you're kind of going mostly in, in treasuries and some reverse repos, maybe, things mm -hmm. like that, maybe a little bit of commercial paper. So you're getting like, say, 80% treasury exposure instead of... 20%, 15%. So it's not to say that there's, it's not like a one-to-one -one trade, but it's not, it's not as though every stable coin represents entirely new treasury demand. It's kind of pulling from other sources that are kind of fractional reserve treasury demand and sticking into something that's closer to hundred percent treasury demand. So I, I think the trend is real, but here's another way of looking at it. Let's say by 2030, there's a trillion market cap of stable coins, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's quadrupling in five years. It's a pretty bullish thesis. U.S. deficits are two trillion a year. Mm -hmm. So in five years, back the envelope, ten trillion in deficits. We'll go from let's call it a quarter trillion to a full trillion in stable coins. That's you know uh, three quarters of a trillion in in demand. But that's not even entirely pull. That's not even entirely new demand. That's again that's pulling a little bit from other sources that already own some treasuries. Let's, let's call it a half a trillion in f entirely fresh demand for treasuries. You've solved five percent of the problem. And let's say this mm. double, it says 10%. You solve 10% of the problem. So it's a factor, but it's not a silver bullet that magically Solution. fixes the, fixes yeah. the problem. Uh, in, in my view, uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to get to you know, these like five or 10 trillion market cap figures to, to, to just structurally change the nature of the problem. And, wow. and, this, and this is at a time where global central banks, global sovereign wealth funds are saying, you know what, I don't know if I want to buy treasuries. I want to buy some extra gold tonnage. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a small country, say, I want to own some Bitcoin, you know, or I want to make a loan. If, if you're China, it's like, I want to make a loan to a infrastructure or a mine somewhere in South America, rather than finance Uncle Sam, who mm -hmm. is going to use it to try to screw me over.